the weak growth in housing sector, the regulation of tech, and the green push are really the most relevant trend we are seeing today. And uh, we will looking forward to more discussions in the following sessions. And now I will give you some update of Caixin's business in overall and in, China, uh, and in Singapore. Uh, one thing is Caixin Data has launched its new B2B data portal, both on the mobile app and as a website services. The data analytic team has also launched a new AI-driven anal analysis, the first time we are bringing an AI-powered knowledge base about the ca carbon neutral roadmap of China. And also we are making progress in Singapore. So Caixin Data Technology has also increased its partnership here. So after the success of uh, our Smart Beta Index Fund in Hong Kong Exchange, we plan to work closely with a Singapore-based company, Innovating AI, and to create advanced algorithms and to provide investment, investment managers the new tools and uh, light indexes to invest into China's capital markets. And do check with my colleagues, myself, and our partners, and uh, share with us your ideas. Now I'll pass the stage to my colleague Li Xin and to formally open the Caixin Summit Singapore. Thank you. Thank you, Fujie. Good morning, our friends. Uh, welcome to see many of you again here since a year, um, a year from our last Caixin Summit 2020. So this year is rather special. Uh, this is our second year to do a Singapore track of the Caixin Summit, but we also do a third leg so this year we'll have Beijing leg of the Caixin Summit, we'll have the Singapore track, and we'll have online, and we have another one in Shenzhen next, um, next month uh, in, in, in December. So why we are doing this is because we, dis we discovered that the discussion goes beyond border. It should, it should take place in China, it should take place in Asia, and we should combine that online, offline, and expand that broader. But we wouldn't be able to do that without your help. From your insights, from our partners, from our readers, from our interviewees, from your insights and from your uh, strong support. So thank you very much for coming and joining us at Taixing Summit again this year. So a brief report to you about what we've done last year or what we plan to do. Just now you heard from Fujie. Actually, Fujie and I represent the two wings of Caixin, not just because we're here. Um, because we have both news and insights. Insights is our think tank arm, also does extensive data business. But in terms of our news, last year we we're doing pretty good as well. So our subscription now increased into about 700,000 paid subscribers. That made Caixin world's number 10 by FIPP rank, and we are the second in Asia, second only to Nikkei in terms of subscription. Why is that significant? Because for a news organization, that is our direct contact with you, with all our readers, and that makes us not just business-wise more sound, but we also have more direct engagement and uh, communication with you all. So, Coming back um, for this year's Taishin Summit, like Fuji explained, that we will have several opening keynote speech to start with. So we uh, start with the first keynote speech is from a Nobel Prize winner, economist Jean Tirole, and he will share with us something very interesting on common prosperity. Without further ado, we will move on to our first keynote speech this morning. Hello, um, welcome to this 12th Kaishin Summit. Uh, my name is Jean Tirol. I'm a professor of economics at the University of Toulouse, and I'm delighted to be invited to give this uh, lecture. The lecture will be on how to foster the common good. Uh, the plan for this lecture will be to first define the common good. We need to know what the common good is about and what its implications are. And then I will move on to say, well, how do you achieve this common good? Contracts, regulation, or civil society? 
And then I will come to the notion of social responsibility and these ESG criteria and their challenges. But the first question, of course, is what is a common good? So the common good um, comes from the fact that there are many situations in which the interest of consumers, of firms, of governments, of countries diverge from the general interest. So for example, we as consumers, we may pollute too much, we may drive too fast, we may refuse to be vaccinated or take too much antibiotics. The firms may take too much risk, they may jeopardize the jobs of their workers or the savings of their investors or maybe public finances, if there is taxpayer money involved. They may abuse their monopoly power, they may misrepresent their products. The state may engage in excessive debt. It may tolerate inequality. It may create financial crisis. It may deprive its citizens of their freedom. The countries may put their country first. So put the, their national interest over the interests of the world. And we have seen that very often with global warming, with trade wars, with fiscal competitions, for example. What is a common feature of all those uh, situations? The common feature is that the individual interest trumps the general interest. The ambition of economics for the common good is to align the actor's interest with the general interest. And there are two instruments to do that. The first instrument is persuasion. So we want to encourage citizens, for example, to engage in good behavior, corporate social responsibility for firms. To that purpose, we may design non-based interventions, which means that we try to boost awareness about the consequences of selfishness. But of course, there are limits to what can be done. Remember that the global warming, for example, has been discussed for 30 years almost since the Rio 1992 summit, and very little has been done, and now we are against the wall. Um, so we need incentives, not only persuasion, we need incentives so as to align the general interest uh, with the individual interest. But what is a common good? The common good can be defined through a thought experiment. This thought experiment has been designed by philosophers over the centuries and it's called the veil of ignorance. It's a very, very simple thought experiment. So imagine that you are not born yet. So you don't know whether you'll be a man or a woman, a Han or an ethnic minority or you are born in a rich family or a poor family, or if you are French or Chinese, or maybe, you know, what, what kind of education you will get, what kind of genes you will get. Will you, will you have a cancer or no cancer? Um, that's the kind of situation that you want to consider and ask yourself a very simple question. In what kind of society would I like to live in? And the answer to this question is going to define the common good. Now, you have to think a little bit, a few caveats. First, it's not a la la land. Um, incentives matter. So we all, whether we are government, uh, a researcher, an unemployed, a firm or whatever, or country, we also stand for our own self-interest. We, we are willing to do the good, but you know, we also defend our own interests, so we need incentives. And remember the Soviet Union, at the start they believed in a, uh, the new man, the Soviet new man, uh, will, will, will devote selflessly uh, to the common good. And of course that was a failure because they forgot about incentive and that ended up with a big economic failure, an environmental failure, a failure in terms of freedom, a failure in terms of everything. And we need to adopt a long-term vision and we should not prejudge instruments. So this sort of experiment is it's actually hard because we are to perform because we actually have a position in society. I'm French, I'm a man of, of this and that, of my own political opinion and so on. It's very hard for me to think about what I would like to get 
behind the veil of ignorance. But still, there are a number of things that can derive from that. So for example, economic efficiency. We want economic efficiency because we want well-being. We want purchasing power. We want to be able to finance an education and health system. So we need an efficiency-oriented legal framework, for example. We need to fight abuses of dominant positions of firms. We need to regulate banks and so on and so forth. So economic efficiency. But then we need a set of insurance mechanisms. So beyond of, of the veil of ignorance, you know, we may be born in a poor family, we may be born in a rich family, but we should be getting the same education, a good education for all, that the equality of chances. We want to have health insurance, so you could be born with a bad health or a good health, you know, and you don't know in advance, so you need insurance against a bad health. We need to correct other inequalities, like gender inequality, like income inequality, and we need protection against life mishaps more generally. And finally, we need societal reg regulation. So we need tolerance, tolerance, because you don't know when you are born which religion you want to adopt, or no religion at all, against your ethnicity, against sexual orientation, against everything. We want tolerance. So the state here is seen as a fixer of market failures. But what if the state also fails? And that's going to be the next question because it's going to bring us to the notion of uh, social responsibility. So let's talk about social responsibility. And let's start with something which is very bizarre, which is the shareholder value oddity. So most of the firms in the world are run by their shareholders, maybe by debt holders if there's distress, but by and large, it's an investor-owned corporation. I mean, of course, there are other types of corporation like not-for-profit and so on, but you know, by and large, the main form of corporation is a shareholder-owned corporation. The rationale for that is that the investors, they want to secure a return on their investment because they won't finance a firm if they are not sure they get, they get a return. And one way of getting a return is to keep control over the management. That's correct, but at the same time, the stakeholders, the other people who have a stake in the firm also are affected by the decision. So you have in mind the workers, the suppliers, the communities where the firm is located, the polluters if there's pollution and so on. So they are what economists call basic decision externalities. The big question then is why do you get so many uh, shareholder owned corporation. And also Friedman's uh, remark, a very fa famous remark in which he says, the only social responsibility of business is to maximize profit. Fine to maximize profit, except that there are externalities on shareholders. Now, there are two reactions to externalities. The first reaction is due to, say, Ronald Cause, who is another Nobel laureate, and he said, we should write contracts. We should write contracts which are going to insulate the stakeholders from the decisions of, of management and, and the shareholders. And there are ways which to do that, and they are used to some extent. So for example, a nominal fixed claim. So a fixed wage for workers, a severance pay when the worker is, is, is fired. Um, for creditors, often it's a fixed, uh, fixed claim as well, plus maybe some collateral or priority ranking in case of, of bankruptcy. The other way of protecting stakeholders is planning's exit option in case they are unhappy with the firm. So for example, for workers that might be general training, flexible labor markets and so on. At the same time, there is only so much that the contract can achieve. Contracts are very imperfect. There are collective action primes as well. So for example, in climate change, we are 7 billion uh, people in the world. We cannot just all write contracts. Same thing for most public policies like competition policies, safety of, 
of food, privacy, and so on. We need to have some collective action. And there are some other failures of the cause uh, logic as well. So for example, we might want to build a nuisance an, an entity in order to then bargaining its withdrawal. It's a little bit technical, I'm sorry, but you know, contracts have their failures. So if contracts have their failures, you need government. And in a sense, that's a vision which in the West has existed for basically two centuries since Adam Smith, and I would say also Pigou. So the Chevrolet value approach to society should be organized so that it protects stakeholders. So you get the invisible end of the market, which is going to harness the pursuit of self-interest to the pursuit of efficiency. At the same time, you will have the state which is going to do two things. The first is to correct market failures, which are due to externalities. So for example, when there is pollution, that's a form of externalities, you hurt somebody else. Or internalities, and internalities basically when people fail to stand for their own best interests. So for example, they might overconsume drugs or not save enough because they are impatient, they are impulsive. That's one thing. Asymmetric information is another market failure. That's why we have, for example, pro consumer protection or investor protection. And then there is another type of market failure, which is inequality. So behind the failure of ignorance, there is no reason why a market should deliver equality of chances, equal, you know, limited inequality in terms of income and wealth. And that's where Pigou comes in and, and many other authors. So basically, contracts don't suffice. You also need regulation. Now, why do we have a social responsibility as individuals, as corporations? Well, in a sense, that's because there is a double failure. Failure of the market and failure of the government. The government may fail for multiple reasons. It may fail because it's captured by lobbies and other interest groups, because the rulers have a quest for personal power, because the governments may pander to electorates, prejudices and misunderstanding, because bad things happen in other jurisdiction. So, for example, child labor. Um, you know, it may not be in your own country, it may be in another country. Oh, and that's something you cannot also discipline through regulation anyway. You know, small things, everyday things, you need social norms to substitute for regulation. And because the government also fails, it's not only the market that fails, we have some social responsibility. And that brings me through three views on corporate social responsibility. The first view I will call win-win doing well by doing good. Now, the first time you hear about doing well by doing good, you smile. You smile because you say, who is crazy enough to actually want to lose money and at the same time do bad things? That sounds strange, right? There's a better interpretation of that. The interpretation is in terms of short term versus long term. So there are some corporations like we have seen the financial crisis with banks, we actually privilege the short term over the long term of the corporation and the long term of society. For example, they may misrepresent their income sheet, their balance sheet, or they may take too much risk. Why? Because they want to cash in a short term bonus or they want fame or they want to keep their job. Now, in that case, they work against both the interests of the corporation, the long-term interest, and also the interests of society. Because interests of society is simply because, you know, the, 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 the workers in the firm or the bank may lose their job. The, the, the taxpayer may have to, to bail out the bank, for example. So there are a bunch of things that are going to go wrong. So according to this view, corporate social responsibility, CSR, 
is about taking a long-term view of maximizing intertemporal profits. And there is a correlation, as I said, because that also protects third parties like the worker or the environment, at the same time as protecting shareholders. So the implication of that is that we should intervene as investors, for example, to force the firms and the managers actually to take a long-term view. And this is just profit maximization, except it's long-term profit maximization. Second view on uh, corporate social responsibility is what I would call delegated philanthropy. The, the firm as a channel for the expression of citizen values. So for example, as a consumer, I'm willing to pay my coffee a little bit more if this is coffee produced in fair trade. So that means that basically um, the workers in, in the poor country who produce a coffee are paid a little bit more. Same thing as an investor, I'm willing to get a slightly lower return uh, if you know, my money goes to financing um, clean, clean firms and, and ethical firms. And workers are willing to, pay, to be paying le paid less if they work for an NGO. But of course, it's profit maximization again, because then the firm actually um, does philanthropy, but on behalf of the consumer, and is going to uh, pass through the extra costs into the price. So, you know, Starbucks will buy fair trade coffee, but at the same time, will charge more for its coffee. It's again profit maximization. And the third item, the third possible view on CSR is real philanthropy of the firm, where the firm actually loses money to do good. Actually, there is some opposition to that, uh, not always, fortunately, but there is opposition from the left and the right side of the political spectrum. Friedman on the right side of the political spectrum actually is very much against uh, this because he says this is a government, this, this is shareholder money, and there is no reason why a manager should have the right to spend money that doesn't belong to him or her. So basically the idea is that the manager can actually do philanthropy, but with his own money. Robert Reich, uh, who is on the left side of the spectrum, of the political spectrum, says, no, no, philanthropy and poly public policy is actually the work of government, not of private firms. Let me conclude with um, three informational challenges. It's actually hard to design ESG criteria, okay? So environmental, societal, and government governance criteria. The first thing is that you have to collect data and collect data along the supply chain. So for example, I would like to know how much this firm I'm buying from pollutes, how much CO2 it emits. But then I have to look at the entire value chain where you know, the subcontractor and the subcontractor, subcontractor are also going to pollute and I have to know how much they have polluted. Then there is data aggregation. So uh, let me come back to Starbucks, for example. Starbucks does nice, nice thing buying fair trade coffee, but at the same time is going to um, optimize on taxes and not pay taxes very much in Europe, for example. So how do you weigh those, this good and the bad? Uh, you know, you need weights uh, to actually compute how good a firm is. Then the valuation is complex. So how do you know an action is good for society or not? So take greenhouse gases, for example. So as an investor, I can invest in a firm which invests in green projects. But of course, if the project will have taken place for whatever reason, for example, it already, it already exists, or maybe it's heavily subsidized by the government and therefore it's going to exist anyway, then if I invest in it, I'm not going to change anything. So in principle, the project should be additional, meaning that it should take place, it should not have taken place without my 
financing it. And that's very hard to know. We, you know, it's very, very hard. We, we want to avoid windfall profits. And then we need to, staying with carbon, we need to compute the savings in terms of, uh, of, of tons of carbon, but also how valuable this is. So you, look, you have to look at all the future prices of carbon, which by the way, is way too small right now. We need a carbon price worldwide and a decent carbon price. And we are very far from it at this stage. And then we need, we need to more generally think about what is socially responsible. I'm not going to develop that, but what we care about is impact, not posture. We want to have an impact and make this world a better place. So let me conclude here with those, with those notes and a few concluding remarks. We still face the challenges that existed pre-COVID, um, but we also have opportunities. AI, genetics, and so on are amazing opportunities. We should become much wealthier and much healthier in the, in the future. But at the same time, we also have all the societal challenges that were not solved uh, prior to COVID. Global warming, the future of labor, multilateralism, which is very important. We are not going to survive in this world if the countries don't work together. Inequality, regulation, debt, and so on. The question people often ask is, what with COVID? Is this going to be a catalyst, catalyst for change? So finally, we become aware that we are fragile and our world is a fragile place? Or is that going to be an echo chamber for our weaknesses? Of course, I prefer the former. And we need to think more about using economics and other social sciences and the common deciphering key is a common good. What kind of society would like to live in if we were behind the veil of ignorance? Thank you so much again for your invitation. Uh, I wish you a very, very successful 12 Kaishin Summit and thank you for your attention. <laughs>